I remember when this place used to be an old time church. <laughs> well, it's good to be here. Let me say that first. Um, those of you who don't know, God has brought us through some, some health things in the last year. And uh, anybody here ever died? It stinks. But we're glad to be here today, and, and I, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna dive right into what I have for y'all because uh, y'all, y'all give me about 20, 30 minutes. We'll add that to what I normally get. I, uh, when uh, this week I, we had a, a cancellation for this weekend, and I, I told my wife, I said, I'm gonna send Bill a. Facebook and see if he'd like for us to just sneak in and surprise everybody. And uh, it worked out. And so here we are. And uh, God started speaking to me about some things. And uh, I always know when I come up here where you guys are at that uh, it's like going to Grace Central. <laughs> you know, I'll, I can always tell when, when I need a, a touch of grace, I just come dive in the pool here. And, uh, and so, when, when the Lord opened, opened that opportunity up for us, the first thing I said was, okay, God, I'm not going to preach about grace. Because they've already heard it all. Twice. <laughs> and, uh, but I sat back there a while ago while these guys were, were worshiping and uh, I, I heard the Lord say something that I'm going to tell you and then we're going to get into it, our word for today I, I heard the Lord say that, that this is the season that he is turning this church around so that you stop focusing your grace on your past and understand that grace is about your future when you find yourself dealing with people that all they can talk about is the amazing grace that delivered them from the sin they used to be in, you need to understand that you're dealing with someone that does not yet have a revelation about grace. Because grace has nothing to do with your past because according to grace, you don't have a past. Boy, I should sure have preach on grace. <laughs> grace is about your future. And that's a little bit of what I want to talk to you guys about today. I, I've been sitting over there squirming a little bit because you guys keep trying to get on my sermon. Stop it. <laughs> Just stop it. Uh, I, 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 I titled my sermon, and I'm always careful about titling my sermons, but I titled my sermon, The Place. How many of you realize that God's got a plan for you? Uh, it, it's a very important and needed message in the church today for people to have an understanding that you did not just randomly wind up where you are. You are where you are, doing what you're doing, being who you are on purpose. God has purpose and intent, and you're in the middle of the plan whether you realize it or not. Contrary to what this carnal little mind tries to tell us, just because you're going through trial and tribulation and devastation, that does not mean that you have somehow fell off the Holy Ghost gravy train and you're no longer in the middle of God's plan. You're still in it. I'll tell you a little something that, that I believe needs to be preached and taught in churches everywhere, regardless of belief system or denominational background, and that is this. Do you understand that God's plan for you is perfect? Amen. That not one moment of your life, not one moment up until this time, has been wasted. Not one. Good or bad, light or dark, in or out, up or down, sick or healthy. Not one moment of your life has been wasted. There is not one moment where God has leaned back in his throne and said, I'm done with that one. 
I'm going to give them a 30 second timeout. There's not a place in your life. You say, yeah, but Brother Allen, you don't know what I've been through. You're right, I don't. I wasn't there. Some of the stuff in my life right now, I can't even, I wasn't, I was there, but I wasn't there. My wife has to tell me what I did. Uh, when you spend seven weeks at a coma, that kind of tends to happen. But I, I'm amazed at how many people today don't realize that God is right in the center of your life and that none of your life is a mistake. It's not an accident that you are where you are. Nothing has been wasted. All of your life, good or bad, light or darkness, up or down, in or out, all of that has been about getting you where you are right now on the way to where you are going through God's grace. God's trying to take you someplace. I'll tell you a little secret about grace that most folks don't understand, and that is that you lack the ability to perceive what grace is taking you to. Wow. The moment that you decide that you have figured out who you are and where you're going. I, I, I've been hearing somebody this morning talk about identity and I wanted to say shut up because you're getting in my stuff. It's a one-man show. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the moment we decide that we've got it figured out and we know where we're headed is the moment that we have stopped functioning according to the law of grace. <laughs> Because grace is going to take you someplace you never thought you'd go. It's going to get you there in a way that you didn't believe you could get there. Even if God has to use you getting fired because of pot to get you in the right place. <laughs> you know, some people will get the spirit high or they... <laughs> If you have your Bibles, uh, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about being in the place. And I've been a lot of, been around the world, done a lot of ministry here and there and where, and uh, I like to know when I get someplace that I'm in the right place. I have a GPS on my phone because I like to know that I'm in the right place when I get there. My GPS on my phone this time brought us into Anderson. We stay over at Anderson. Brought us into Anderson a little bit different way than I've ever come before so that when we started coming into Anderson, I wasn't sure we were where we were supposed to be. Have you ever looked around at your life and thought, God, is, is this really... <laughs> When I, get, when I started coming out of the coma in the hospital, and, and Lord, I can't get into telling too many of those stories or take all that, but when I started coming out of the coma in the hospital, there was a day there that, that uh, at a couple of times during each day, they would make all of my family leave the room, and I'd be left in the room alone. And I was laying there in the room looking around and, and realizing that my left arm was completely paralyzed except for these three fingers. And I couldn't walk anymore and had a, 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 an incision that was 20 centimeters long and two and a half inches wide and an inch and a half deep. And, and all this stuff was going on and, and, and God had been taking me on, uh, on some out-of-body experiences and I had all this stuff going on in my mind and I'm laying there in the bed. And if you really want to know the truth, for just a minute I just got mad. You know, it would do some of you good to get mad. Get mad at God and yell at Him so He can get your attention. I'm laying there in the bed in that hospital and I got a little bit mad and I said, God, you have lost your mind. Hey, my wife says it to me all the time, so I thought I'd try it just a <laughs> you have, You've lost your mind. I, I told him, I said, God, I was there. I, I was dead and done, and, and, and you sent me back? I can 
think of a hundred people just like that that, that are, are more anointed and greater and have greater contacts and have the ability to go play much better preachers. I can think of a hundred people real quick, real easy that should have been the ones that you sent back, but you sent me back. Have you lost your mind? You ever been in that place where you look around and wonder, dear God, is this really the place? Because if this is the place where God's taken me, it's not going to be any fun at all. Think about it. Genesis. I'm going to start in the first book of preach till I get to the end. Amen. Y'all have to Genesis chapter 22. We're, we're, we're going to read a little bit here about uh, Abraham. I like, I like to read the Old Testament. Prophetic people like the Old Testament. I like to read the Old Testament. I, I love to read about Abraham. And this, this particular story, the, the son of it is, is he's, uh, he, he's just come through the whole thing of, of hearing from God that he's going to have a son. Imagine that, being 90 years old. Hearing God say that sometime in the very near future you're going to have a son. Talk about being in the wrong place. <laughs> I mean, first of all, you haven't been able to have a child up until you're 90 years old. And then as a man, God tells you, I'm not only going to give you a kid, but you're going to get a ringer. <laughs> I'm going to give you a son that's going to make you the father of many nations. And it's so powerful what I'm doing, I'm going to change your name. See, what I, what I, what I realized is this. I, I was thinking about, it, it, it's good to have my, my, my friend, Miss Tony, back here with us today. I, I just shot her a little note. I, don't, I didn't know if we were supposed to tell anybody or not, but I told her. And, and she she come to, to see us, and I'm glad. I was sitting over there thinking about uh, somebody said something more about being in a storm. I'll tell you something about storms. Storms are all about atmosphere. The best way for you to get out of the storm that you're in is to become a more powerful storm than the one you're in. The best way to overwhelm the circumstances you're in is to become more powerful than what's coming against you. You know, that's another sermon. Amen. I don't have time. Yeah. Abraham, he's in the place that God's done told him, you know, you, you, you're going to have a son. And he's realized that at that point in time, he was 90 years old and, and, and Sarah was, was 80. It, 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 it took 10 years before they were finally able to actually have, have that son. But, but they decided that wasn't going to work, you know, that... God lost his mind. And so in, in the process of time, they did what we all do. They started trying to figure out how they could make God's plan happen. Uh, I cry unto the Lord where my help comes from. I call out to him to talk to him about my destiny. And then when I realize that he doesn't know how to handle my destiny, I tell him how to do it. Just because I want to keep God happy and laughing. <clears throat> but uh, they, we, we know the story that they were afraid it wasn't going to work so Sarah gave him her servant and, 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 and they made a son and, and uh, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan all this mess that we're in is because of Abraham and Sarah couldn't be patient but that's another sermon too anyway uh, long story short Sarah gets pregnant. They have Isaac. She can't have another inheritor in the camp. She can't stand it. So they've just come out of this whole thing where Sarah has, has enforced that Abraham remove the, the problem. And, and so he's come through all of that. And right here in, in chapter 22, beginning with verse 1, it starts out and it says, And it came to pass after these things, these things being all this mess that he just came through, now that he's come through the hard stuff, 
of, of God helping him fix up what he messed up. How many of you understand that a lot of times the reason that the place that we're in doesn't make sense to us is because we're in the place of our own making? We're in the place of our own making. Most of the time, if you don't like where you are, you have no one to blame for your... That's not very nice, is it? Preach the truth about that. It came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering unto the Lord. To the mount, I'm sorry about that, I lost the place. Get thee to the, to the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon the mountain which I will, will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and played the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. I found myself a lot of times, especially in, in this last year, I'm finding myself saying to God a lot, are, are you sure I, I'm in the right place? I mean, what, what we have just come through in this last couple of years has, has completely and totally shifted the very destiny of the life that we're walking out. All the things that I thought we had figured out, all the things that had been laid in place, even, I'll even go so far as to say this, even prophetic words that I had heard from in, in my past that were supposed to be about my future have been shifted and shaken. It's not that the word that was given was wrong. It was that my understanding of the word was not in line with what it was that God was doing for me. And so in this last year, I have found a great shifting that has happened in my life. And I'm amazed at the amount of people that I'm finding in the kingdom of God that are being devastated by the reality that they just don't know who they are or where they're at. They can't seem to find the ability to progress into the fullness of what God has for them because they can't find themselves in the place where they are. Do you understand that you're in a place that God intended for you to be even if it's a place that you don't like? I can imagine how Abraham must have felt to realize that in this tent he had Sarah and the son of promise. And over in this tent he had a mess. Am I the only one here that's ever had a miracle and a mess in the same house? Abraham finds himself in this place. And, and I'm looking at the church today and I'm trying to figure out exactly how it is that many of us have got into this place. And, and the Lord brought me to this story this week and I suddenly saw something that I've read it, I don't know how many hundreds of times, but it never stuck out to me before like it did this time. And, and so I'm going to read it to you again. We start back in verse 1. It says, And it came to pass after these things. Now listen. That God did tempt Abraham. You ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about the reality that maybe where you're at has been instigated by God? I've been taught my whole law, whole life that God doesn't tempt anyone. That no man that is tempted is tempted of the Lord. Really? That's not what that says. Did you ever consider the concept that maybe the, the trial and the temptation that you're going through is the grace of God? Man. That maybe the devastation that you're facing actually is the manifestation of God's grace in your life? Did it ever cross your mind? I, I'm sure when Abraham found himself in this place and he looked around, he, he had to have been thinking... God, 
What did I do? How did, how did I get here? Knowing that when he started on this journey, the whole idea was about getting to the place that God told him to go to. God told him, he said, I'm going to take you. I'm going to show you the place on the mountain that I want you to go. And when I get you there, I'm going to give you the opportunity to give me the ultimate sacrifice so that you can, in sacrificing, you can receive the ultimate blessing. And so here it is. I'm, I'm in the midst of doing exactly what God wants me to do in the place that God wants me to do it. And I suddenly realize that now it's not good enough that I'm being tried and tempted by the enemy, but God. You say, oh, well, I, 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 I don't believe God does that. You, you, you need to study in your word. You know, Abraham's not the only fellow that found himself being issued a challenge by God. Job. In, in, in Job chapter 1 verse 8 it says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant? Job, boy, talk about a good day. What kind of day is it when you get out of bed in the morning and you hear the, the first words you hear come out of the voice of the Lord is, Oh, and by the way, I used you as a challenge for the devil, so if he comes after you today, don't think anything about it. <laughs> I'm fighting with the devil, and I chose you to be my sword today. Really? Isn't it amazing that? Well, look, listen. God, God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, he said, Behold, here I am. Now, if I don't talk about temptations in, in the light of, of, of grace and mercy and all the things that we... I need to know for sure what temptation is. So let me give you a Webster's real quick. Webster's Dictionary says the, the word tempt... It, it, it's a verb. It's, it's an action thing. You understand that the things that God's taking you into, He's not taking you into a place so that He can settle you there. The place is about movement. That, that's a great misconception in the church today is we think we're going to get out through here, move out through here in the anointing, and we're suddenly going to find a place and settle in. The minute you settle in, you, you need to batten down the hatches and, and lock everything down because the minute you settle, the earth beneath your feet is going to begin to quake because being in the right place with God at the right time is never about finding a place to settle. It's always about finding the place to propel you into the next dimension that you're supposed to be moving into. Amen. Amen. It does say that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever in the Word. But I have news for you, darling. You're not God. So you don't get to be the same yesterday. Anyway. Tempt. To be tempted. It means to entice or allure to do something often regarded as unwise, wrong, or <laughs> To be tempted. To be, to be tempted, it means to attract or appeal strongly to, to invite. God invited Abraham. Abraham, I want you to do something. I want you to do something that I fully intend to do, but I haven't got there yet. I have said my whole life, preaching in, in church and ministering around the world, I've always told people, never worry, do not worry or be afraid. God will not ask you to do anything that He won't do Himself. And yet right here, He's asking Abraham to sacrifice his son and he hasn't done it yet. He says, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your one and only son. Now here's the thing that you got to realize. 
is God was making the choice to sacrifice His Son as an atonement so that we could have that grace thing that we talk about all the time. That's the reason that came about. But He was asking Abraham to sacrifice His Son, not for man, but for him. See, I learned something in, in the middle of studying about this and listening to the voice of the Lord. What God asks you to do, the place that He asks you to go, is not about the circumstance, the situation. It's not about what happens in that moment. It's about the seed being planted. It's all about the fruit that is going to come out. Amen. Of the interaction with the Father. Amen. What are you going to produce? See, what Abraham didn't realize was that it was not good enough that he had sown into Isaac's life. You understand that by the time this story happens, we always think of this story and we think of little Isaac like, you know, like, like this. And, and we think that, that Abraham took him and, and he was able to overpower him and tie him up and put him on the altar. But actually, he was about 23 or 24 years old. He was a full-grown, fully muscular young man who now had a father who was in excess of 120 to 125 years old, who did not in himself physically have the ability to force him to get on that altar. What we don't understand is that as the sacrifice, Isaac had to be more willing than his father was as the sacrificer. Amen. But what... what Abraham didn't understand and here's what we're missing. Some of you are going through something right now and you can't understand why you're in the place that you're in. What Abraham didn't realize was it is not good enough that he has spent 20 plus years sowing seed into the life of Isaac, his son, because unless a seed fall into the ground and die... It was not good enough that he had sown so much into what God had given him. He had to reach the place where he was willing to release the destiny that he was determined and demanding to maintain. He had to release that into the hands of the Father, understanding that until I sow this seed into the solid foundation of my Father, God's grace will not be manifest. What I'm working to produce will not be worth picking. My fruit, listen, my fruit will have meat, but no seed. I, 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 used to, I used to use this saying a lot. I, I like apples. Anybody here like apples? You know what's cool about an apple? Is you can count the seeds that are in an apple. The average apple has 8 to 12 seeds in it. You can count the seeds that are in an apple, but you can't count the apples that are in a seed. You take an apple seed and you plant it. In an average of 24 months, that seed will go from seed to tree. And in 24 months, it will begin to produce its first harvest. Then the average apple tree will produce a full harvest, an average of 36 to 38 years. In those harvests, each apple will have 8 to 12 more seeds that will in turn produce 36 to 38 more years of apples with more seeds and more future and more seeds and more future. The reality is, is many of us have learned the process of producing the meat of the fruit, but we have yet to yield ourselves to the, the simplest of concepts that what we have and are must die. Grace is never going to manifest for you until you allow who and what you are to die out to the provider of grace. What, what is it that uh, 
Romans. Romans says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? That right here is a great misconception. I may mention it, alluded to it a while ago. We, we spend so much time trying to figure out how to apply grace to our past sins. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? In the instant somebody quotes that to us and begins to preach on it, we immediately start looking over our shoulder and thinking about what I did and how God has forgiven me. What I did and how God has forgiven me. But that scripture is not about your past, it's about your future. That's why he said, shall we continue. That word right there changes the very definition of that passage. Shall we talk about your past? Shall we continue? I, I'm here today to tell you that this body of believers is stepping into an entirely new realm. I felt it today when we got out of the car and come walking in the front door of the building today. I felt that in this room today I was going to be speaking to a people that before you can leave this building today, your destiny is going to have shifted in such a fashion that many of you are going to leave here feeling almost unbalanced if not unsettled because you're going to feel as though you're going out a different door than what you came in. There's a shifting that is happening in the house today. Not because I'm here, but because he's here. Not because I have said or done anything, but because we have found a place where today we are going to lay down those things that have been given by God so that that seed can die. Because when we leave here today, we're going to leave with a baptism of grace that's going to give us, listen, that's going to give us the ability to speak the language of grace. How many of you baptized in the Holy Ghost? Anybody here speaking tongues? You understand that there is a language, a holy language, a language that I, I love to pray in that language. The devil don't know what I'm talking about. It's kind of like talking to a woman. I'm just repeating what I heard Pastor Bill say. We understand that there is a Holy Spirit language. Do you realize there's a grace language? That there is a language that you can begin to speak that the circumstances and situations of your life cannot intervene in that language because they can't understand what you're saying. It makes no sense to the hearer unless they have received the impartation of the same Spirit. I said I wasn't going to do all this. I'm trying to be quick. And you all are slowing me down. He, he, he was tempted by God. I mean, have you ever looked around at your circumstance and tried to figure out, God, what are you doing? Why are we here? You stand in the, in the doctor's office and they say, cancer. This can't be God. You, you, you get a phone call about your children. And it's not telling you that they're stepping out in the ministry. Your husband or your wife comes walking through the front door of the house with the word divorce on the end of their tongue. You find out that everything that you have worked for and saved for all of your life has suddenly vanished away because the market has shifted. A devastating storm comes through the area and destroys all that you have. How can this be God? How can the preacher look me in the face and tell me that in the middle of this, I am in the middle of who God is. I'm right in the place. Do you understand that God spoke to my Abraham here and he said, I'm going to send you to a place and I'm going to 
take you there that we might have a level of communication that is beyond what you have known before. Do you understand that God was asking Abraham to go into an unusual place to do a normal thing? It was a normal, typical thing for Abraham to go into the temple and to offer sacrifice there. At least once a year, he would take a sacrifice that would be given to push his and his children, his family, his, his tribe of people. It would push their sin ahead for a year. They continually were giving offerings and, and, and sacrifices of praise unto God. But do you understand that this time God said, I'm not interested in taking you in the place that you know, in a place that you understand, that you have a perception of. I want to take you to a place where only I am. Amen. Do you understand? How many of you ever hear anybody talk about, man, I'm having victory, I'm on the mountain. Do you understand that God was taking Abraham to his victory place so that he could take his victory away from him? Man, Brother Allen, you're not being very encouraging this morning. Stick with me. We're getting there. If you don't know how to do anything else, just tread water. Oh my goodness. Abraham finds himself in a place. This is, I'm on the mountain now. I, I'm finding myself. I mean, we have, Moses went on the mountain and got divine revelation from God. Abraham goes on the mountain and gets shook down by God. I want you to go into this mountain. I'm going to take you. I'm going to tell you the place to go. I'm going to tell you what to take when you're going there. But do you understand the reality? Abraham knew what the sacrifice was going to be, but he had no idea how he was going to fulfill the concept of sacrificing. I preached a sermon one time and I titled it Sacrificing Isaac. <coughs> how many of you here have a ministry that should be every hand in the house? If you don't know it, you have a ministry. Yes, women, even those men. Do, do you understand that what it is that God has given you, what He has brought you out of, what we call our destiny, that ministry that God has established in you, He is seeking for the place that you will understand the need for sacrificing, the need for His trying of your faith, so that what he has given you might find its way back into his hand where it will be multiplied and given back to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Now, I don't have all day, so I can't, I can't go into all of it, but I, I love the way that the scripture plays out here. It, it, it's, God speaks to him, he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. Get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Listen, he, he told him, take thy son. He's going to require you to gather an offering. How many of you are ready for the reality that God is moving this church, this ministry, each of you as individuals as well as all of you as a corporate body, he's moving you into a new place. I remember... Uh, just a, uh, it's been a few months ago, back, back before I got sick, I remember talking to this man on the phone. And I, I don't remember a lot about what I said to him, but I remember telling him that God had spoken that he was going to begin to use this house like a springboard and that he would find himself going out into lands away from here that it was going to become more of an apostolic missionary work that he was going to find himself feeling as though he was away more than he was present. I asked my wife the other day, I, I watch these guys on Facebook all the time. I asked my wife, I said, how does he do it? The guy is gone all the time. He's never home. 
I've tried 13 times to get a hold of him so I could come up and be in service with you guys. Every time I get a hold of him, he's in Tahiti or something. I don't know. <laughs> Although I will mention that he, like I, had yet to find a way to receive the call of God to do missions work in Hawaii. <laughs> Do you understand that God is going to begin to demand of you an offering? God is looking for something from you because He is desiring a means of sowing back into you. I told you, I, I don't have time to go into all this. I, I got to cut to the chase right, right quick. I, I'm up here telling you all today about this temptation that Abraham went through and how it seemed like, like God was against him. But what I'm trying to express to you is the reality that when Abraham, because see, Abraham knew before he ever left the house, before he gathered up the animals and gathered together the wood, before he set his men aside and made preparation to go on this journey, God had already told him, I'm going to take you to this place, and when I get you there, you're going to have to sacrifice the very promise that I gave you, the one and only promise that I gave you that will link you to becoming the father of many nations. If you lose this promise, you have lost the reality of all that I have said you would become. If you give up this ministry, if you give up this relationship, if you give up this placement, if you lose this job, this child, this home, this family, if you lose this thing that you are holding to so tightly, the, the, the common sense is going to tell you that you have lost your ability to obtain what you have been promised. And there is nothing that frightens children of God as bad as realizing that I've lost the last connection between me and the promise of the destiny that God has for me. And yet, in the middle of that, he made the choice to load up his promise and to load up all that was necessary to destroy that promise, to kill it as a sacrifice. And he took it to the place where God spoke to him to take it. See, Abraham understood this. I have to let this thing go because it's never going to mature. I'm never going to be blessed in it. I will be the father of one son until I release my son into the hands of the true father who will make one son many nations. God's trying to get something out of your hands so that it will stop being centrally located and will become worldwide available. Wow. He's trying to alter your destiny so that your destiny is no longer what you can perceive in your line of sight. Do you understand this? Let me tell you this about destiny. Destiny is not a point in time. It's a great misconception. Destiny is not a point in time. You are not going to rock along in your relationship with God and all of a sudden have some great encounter with God and, and, and somebody flip a switch and you'll be able to say, Aha! I made it! I finally made it to my destiny! That's not a destiny. Destiny is not a moment in time. Destiny is the fullness of time. Your destiny started the moment you became a thought in God's mind and it will not cease to be until such time that you're back in His presence. Your destiny for you started with that very first heartbeat and breath. If you're 40 years old, your destiny started 40 years ago. And that destiny will not be fulfilled until we plant you as a seed. <laughs> I'm trying to say it nice. Do, do, do you understand? Do you grasp the concept here that some of us are not attaining the fullness because we're afraid to let go of our seed? But God made me a promise, Brother Allen. I know that. 
You don't understand, brother. God has made promises about my son. I know that. God has made promises to my wife and I about our daughter. I get that. Brother Allen, you don't realize this ministry, it's all I have. It's all, I mean, my very identity is tied up in this thing. How, how can I let it? I can't let this go. It'll die. God is looking for someone who's willing to let go of what you're able to do in favor of all that he can do. You know, you're enduring the struggle in your daily life. You're enduring the fight and the struggle on the job and in your family, in your home, not just your immediate family, in your whole family. You're enduring the struggles, things that you can't even begin to explain to people things, stories you wouldn't begin to tell because you're afraid of what it might do to who you are and your relationships. You're enduring these struggles because ultimately in ministry you're going to find yourself walking on a higher plane, a place where you will not endure the struggles that you endure now. Your ultimate is not going to be to get a promotion on that job. Your ultimate is going to be when you can leave the job behind. You made a mistake a few months ago. According to the world's way of thinking. You made a mistake. You decided to press towards the bottom. Pride. High calling. You decided that what you've had up until this point is not enough. You decided you don't want to walk through the same valley again. You don't want to fight the same battle again. You don't want to be overwhelmed again by the things that have been before. And so you embraced something new. I can't imagine what Abraham must have felt in that moment. When Isaac willingly laid himself down on the altar of sacrifice and he tied him up and Abraham has that dagger hoisted in the air. Some of you are at that point right now and you're fighting, you're struggling. Do I, do I dare? I really when you were standing on the stage this morning I heard the Lord say this man is a mouthpiece for me this man is a mouthpiece for me he said for me to tell you do not be afraid to open your mouth and speak those things that comes from the depth of your innermost being God's been asking you lately to say things that you would not normally say. He's asked you on a couple of occasions just recently to draw a line in the sand, but you, you, you didn't want to deal with that confrontation. God said, be not afraid, but speak the things that I have called to you to speak, for I have called you a mouthpiece called you a mouthpiece. You will speak and the earth will tremble. You will sing forth and the heavens will roll back. You have just recently told God that there's got to come a change. Something has got to happen. We've got to see some kind of divine intervention. God says, I've already given you the divine intervention. It is in your mouth. Speak those things that are not as though they are and see what I will do. For I will create beauty where you have seen ashes. 
this is the a divine change. You know, it's not always easy to take that step for God. It's not always easy to, to flow in the way that, because we, we have these pictures. Am I the only one that does this? I get these pictures in my mind of what it ought to be, what it ought to look like, how it should, things should manifest. I know I'm probably the only one who does that. I've already, my, my daughter's eight years old. I've already got her life lived. <laughs> I've already figured out how she's going to build me this big multi-million dollar mansion. Amen. <laughs> and all the parents said, yay, Lord, amen. <laughs> Actually, I need to rephrase that. I've got it figured out how she's going to pay for somebody professional to build me. <laughs> said now is the time and the season that you should understand that his hand is upon you. His hand has been upon you for some time. That every step that you take is divine. The words that you say do not come from the depth of your innermost being that you are speaking out of the bowels of God. God said for you to know that over the next few days and weeks you're going to speak and the circumstances are going to answer to what you speak. I am showing you that from the before the time you I already had calling was already about me. I had already placed my mark in your forehead and on your heart. You know, in your youth, the enemy tried to take you out more times than you can. Tried to bring accident and sickness and devastation. Tried to tear apart your home and destroy your ability to have any kind of solid foundation. And yet through all of that, God has maintained you and kept you and brought you to the place where he was able to set your feet on this solid foundation. In fact, the truth is, when you began to hear the word of grace, it was so at odds with what you had ever heard and what you had ever been taught that for a time you refused to take part of and refused to believe it. In fact, the truth be told, you were looking for every way you could to try to tear it down and prove them wrong. And then something happened. God said, I brought you to this place today to let you know that offering that you have given me. You had to yield a lot and give up a lot to come sit here and to become a participant. By the way, you are whether you know it or not. Everybody around here knows they don't will put your name in the paper this week. <laughs> You have yielded up the gift that God has given you. And today, the anointing that we're going to release on you today is your seed breaking through the ground. The Lord says, by this time next season, you will gather a harvest that you do not have room enough to contain. You will find yourself striving to give away harvest because you have no place to store it. Do not be overwhelmed by the past two seasons of storm and devastation that have destroyed your harvest. But trust me and know that I have kept every seed that was lost and they will be restored to you they and 
their fruit. Father, we thank you for that anointing. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I release that divine grace. Manifest. Manifest what you have promised, my brother. He has willingly yielded his sacrifice. His gift he has laid on the altar. Now let him see. Let him see the ram in the thorns and the bushes. Let him see right now that you are providing. You're giving him exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You're giving him exactly what you have promised. Not only restoring the seed, but giving the fruit that that seed was intended to produce. Father, I release that. I thank you that we've survived the storm, but I praise you. With exuberance and joy, I praise you for the miraculous that has come in spite of who I am. Father, I release that anointing. I release that glory. The fresh, fresh anointing. Let it come forth out of this vessel. Somebody raise your hands and thank God. Highly unlimited emotions. You need to write it down. You're, you're pretty good about listing things. You, you, you have a good memory and you keep record. The Lord says, keep record of what I've promised and of what I'm doing. Because faster than you can write it down, the promise is going to manifest. Anybody here believe God can do that? Yeah. 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 Isn't it amazing? We think we've got it all figured out, how God has to work. I was, I was raised in a church that we did that. There was a certain... Sister Sue, didn't shout first and nobody else got a <laughs> You need to know, sis, you need to know, God says your harvest is tripling in size. You need to prepare yourself, strengthen yourself because it's going to take more of you to receive what is being given than has ever taken before. God said His glory is going to be so manifest that the grace is going to become so tangible that you're literally going to be able to feel it as though it's oil in your hands. He said the glory is going to so overwhelm you that your harvest is going to overwhelm your ability to receive. <laughs> the harvesters are going to overwhelm the sowers. You're, you're used to gathering in a harvest that's this size, but you're going to be bringing in things that are this size. 
You're used to praying for others and agreeing with others and seeing their harvest come in. But this is about the harvest coming into your house, into your home, and your family. What has been destroyed through a, and I'm always kind of careful about saying things like this, but what has been destroyed through a process of time. There's been, a, there's been a certain amount of time that has passed. And, and you could go back right now if we let you tell the story. And you could tell us this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. And everything that has happened has been a direct response to something that happened before. So through the process of time, this devastation and this destruction that's come against your home, your family, and, and the health of your family. You have watched that process of time strip them down until it seems as though there's no help for restoration. But God said right now in this season that you are going to see that the process of time is over. And now the instant of reconciliation is happening. The instant of reconciliation. To reconcile, to write it off, to mark it off as though nothing ever happened. You won't even be able to see the scar where the wounds were before. You won't find any lack of ability or inability to use or move in what has... Nothing that has been before is going to devastate what is coming into your home and family. The ones that have... that, that There are two in your family that have drawn a line in the sand and they said, that's it, I don't want to here, leave me alone. I'm right. You're wrong. They they made their they they. That's it. They're, God said you're going to see them tear down their wall of resolution, and they're going to receive reconciliation and be restored into home and family because greatness is what I have called into your home, and greatness is what is going to manifest. You will not be content to partake of the poor man's table of the fat that has no value but you will eat of the table of meat that will bring strength into your home and your family you will see them arm in arm again You know, he, he said, seek first the kingdom of God. I'll tell you something about seeking the kingdom of God. When you seek the kingdom of God, it messes up your stuff. Because when the kingdom of God begins to manifest, it destroys anything that we know in the physical world. When the kingdom of God begins to manifest, joy comes where there should be sorrow. And exuberance comes where there should be contentment. When you want to be angry, all you can do is bless. The kingdom of God, if you just want to really know the plain old Texas truth about it, the kingdom of God makes no earthly sense. When you get in the kingdom of God, it's the minute that you look God in the face and ask Him, God, have you lost your mind? Are you sure? Really? Me? God says you need to go back and reread some of the prophetic promises that I have made you because I have brought you now into a season where what I have promised, the forgotten harvest, is beginning to manifest right now. In your life, in the next few days, you're going to see that harvest begin to come up out of the ground. And the Lord says, do not be surprised do not be overwhelmed when you see the trees come up out of the ground fully grown and full of fruit straight out of the ground. God says you need to go back and review. If you've got CDs or tapes or if you have books that you have written words in that you have received in the past, you need to go back and dig those out. Dig out the ones that you really wanted, you were really hoping when you received that word, I really hope this really... Go dig those out because those are the very words that are in the process of manifesting for you. This is no longer your 
plowing and planting season. You are now in the harvest season. This is your season of harvest. Y'all know what that means when, when God starts telling you you're in your harvest season, don't you? He's trying to make sure that you have enough warning to go get the barn swept out and ready. You don't want to put new harvest in a barn that's dirty from last year's bounty. It's like putting new wine in an old wineskin. It just won't work. You put in your new harvest on top of the old harvest that was there and the rottenness of what is left will destroy what God has just given you. God says you need to begin to make room because right now you don't have enough room. If, if you were to see and know right now today the things that he's going to give you, it would so emotionally overwhelm you that it would thrust you into doubt before you could even receive because the things that he's working on right now are completely outside the boundaries of common sense and ability. There, there are a couple of areas in your life that according to what we know and what we understand, it can happen. It, it, it's not possible. God can't work with that person because they've already made a choice. They've made a decision. You, you just don't know how stubborn they are. I love to say this to people. You're right. We don't know how stubborn they are. But I can tell you something they don't know. They don't know who created stubbornness. <laughs> when you begin to make room, you need to start stretching your ability to perceive what you're about to receive. You know, it's really important to be able to perceive before you receive. That, that, that's where a lot of people get confused. They try to receive before they perceive it. And then when it comes, it's bigger or smaller or different or it's not what they were expecting. I, I receive the financial blessing, but it doesn't come in a check. So then, because we didn't get a check in the mail, we think we never got our blessing. <clears throat> it's because we never took the time to perceive what we were supposed to receive. All right, he'll just look at me like I was. <laughs> That's all right by me. I don't care. Is that trouble with Catherine T? Lord says there's a new responsibility coming into your life. There's a new anointing coming to you that is going to press you as a vessel, as a person. It's going to press your physical side and push you into a new level of maturity and understanding. You're going to find yourself doing things that you don't think you will do because you're a Toys R Us kid. <laughs> you know, I don't want to grow up. I'm a Toys R Us kid. You're a Toys R Us kid. You like being the baby. <laughs> you like for everybody to think that you got it all on the ball, but she likes I know. I, I, I know. I know how that works. I'm that way. I like to be the baby. Not because I want people to think I'm a baby, but because I get all the attention. God wants you to know that you're about to take some steps that are going to move you into a new place that are going to move you beyond what you think you're capable of doing. This is not to scare you. It's to get you ready to take the most exciting trip you've ever taken. God's about to take you on a missionary journey and you're not going to need a passport.
and by the time you're finished, even at a young age, you're going to realize that what God is walking you through right now is bookworthy. You're going to want to write it down because eventually you're going to look back on this and you're going to put it into a book. See, God knows just exactly how smart you are. Much smarter than you let everybody around you think. You know, most, most young people that do that, they don't want everybody to know how smart they are because if everybody knows they're really smart, they'll expect a lot out of them. I guess I should say most people, not just young people. Young people aren't the only one that do that. We do that. This is a good time for you. This is a great blessing for you, even though you don't understand it yet. Don't worry, he'll explain it to you later. You go back and listen to this word and realize that God just set you up. God just set you up. I, I, what I'm seeing in my mind in the spirit while I'm talking to you. Any of you ever set up a bunch of dominoes? I can see this huge room with dominoes everywhere. And I see God using you and setting you as the first domino. You're gonna, God's going to use you to start a chain reaction that's beyond you. Hallelujah. And what you do is going to have an effect in a whole other realm beyond what you can see. You know, the first domino doesn't realize it, but the last domino would never fulfill its purpose unless the first domino first fell. You're going to propel some folks into their destiny. Take that word myself. 
I thought of this this morning when I um, come back and I'm standing back there talking. I haven't thought of this in a long time. We talk, I'm living in Oklahoma, so we talk a lot about tornadoes. I know y'all don't know what tornadoes are. Yeah, we, we talk about tornadoes a lot. We talk about the tornado that, that a couple of times has destroyed us around Oklahoma City. And, and uh, I had a nice, this was back before I got sick. In fact, I think this may have been before I met you. I had a night one night where I, uh, in the night I woke up, I was dreaming about this storm. And when I woke up, the Lord began to speak to me. And uh, back then I had, a, I had a, a group of people that when I would get prophetic things, I would put it in an email and send it out to all of them. And, and so the Lord started speaking to me about this storm that I had been dreaming about. It was the most unusual uh, storm like this that I could remember anything or know anything about. It was like a hurricane, but it was on land. And I put in this email that I sent out that, that and I, I knew I was talking about this both physically and spiritually, that we were about to move into the most massive, destructive storm season that we've ever seen. That the storms that were going to come were going to bring such devastation, but that we needed the devastation because now was the season that we were to begin building new. Listen, and I never, I, I never, and I'm still not real sure exactly how to explain this. We were, it was time for us to begin building new houses on old foundations. And I, I put in there that. The Lord said that we would see tornadoes that would be so wide that the base of them would be five miles wide and that on the inside these tornadoes would look like hurricane with an eye in the middle of them and that they would be able to see them from space. I put all that in that email and sent it out. I remember thinking after I put that in there and sent it out, dear God, that lost my mind. These people are going to think I'm crazy, sure as the world. The next night, 24 hours later, the next night, a tornado hit El Reno, Oklahoma. The base of that tornado was three miles wide. It had an eye in it like a hurricane. And I saw pictures on the Discovery Weather Channel from space, you could see the eye of that tornado right down through the middle of it. They put it in the in the record books. It was the widest, largest tornado since they have started recorded history. I said all that to say this. The storm that God is using you to erect. And that's the word that he keeps giving me. You're building this thing. Each of, each of the meetings that you're having, others perceive that to be the storm. They don't understand that each of these meetings is but one element. And that once you have completed those and all of those elements come together, it's going to build such a broad reaching storm that you'll not be able to see from one end of it to the other. The Lord said that what He's using, the storm that He's using you to erect is about doing away with that which is dilapidated and building new houses on old foundations. God said it's not that the principles that they had in the past are not right. It's that they have built on them with their own understanding rather than allowing me to establish what should be built. I, I don't know. Is it possible to build a building on an old foundation? I don't know. I need to study that out. God said for you to know that you do not have the hammer in your hand. Because I did not call you to wield the hammer. God said you 